as you, I also came around. I was against the Convention of States, but I have also, after reading and reading and reading, I have become convinced that you're absolutely correct. That that era we need to use, and it's unfortunate that we're even having to have this conversation, Senator, do you know? Why should we be doing this at all if the federal government would simply live within its means? I mean, here we are in, in the state of South Carolina, and we know how to live within our means. I'm sure you and your family and your budget, you know how to live within your means. The rest of us do. We all do. We all have to do it. It's a fundamental uh, way of doing business. And yet our federal government, for reasons unknown, has decided to, to spend $30 trillion above and beyond what we've taken in. So my concern is, is that there are those people that oppose it, and I think we have to continue to work to educate them, make sure that they understand that this is our opportunity as states. Those powers that are left to the federal government are to the federal government. Those to the states are left to the states, and those not to the states go to the people. But at the end of the day, it's the people, we the people who have accepted this government, have the right to call upon the government, do we not? to do right. And so if our legislatures, as uh, the senator uh, spoke of just a few moments ago, would do their job, yes, we could replace them. That's one option. And replace them and hope that the new senator or, or the new congressman would make sure that they got it through and they got a balanced budget or a physical restraint. We couldn't balance the budget right now if we wanted to. It would take, it would take a number of years for us to do that. It'd be like... Um like rehab from a drug addiction, you have to wean yourself off of it is what would happen. And, and wouldn't that take a few years it'd to take, do that? Take a few years, yes. And we'd probably have to do something to tie it to a, a the, 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 our budget. It'd have to be tied to our gross national product in some way, shape, or form. Yes. And, and so this language does not use the term balanced budget, it does use fiscal restraint. Balanced budget is a form of fiscal restraint, but it's not limited to the balanced budget. Well, back when Ronald Reagan, in, in May 23, 1987, he said, I'm one of those Americans who has always believed the constitutional amendment mandating that Congress balance the budget is the answer to what ails us. But he also went on later on and said that in the event they don't, then we have to turn to the states, and the states have to step up to the to the plate and take that responsibility and remind the federal government. You also agree, Senator, that oftentimes, because there may be sufficient 34 states, that all of a sudden the federal government will decide we had better do it, or the states may very well take that power from us. Well, Senator, that's historically that is what has happened, as we've discussed with the 17th Amendment in 1911. The, there were before the last application, there was one application left that would have called the Convention of States, and, and when Congress saw that it was likely that there would be a Convention of States called, they, they exercised their power under Article V and called their, and, and amended the Constitution themselves to, to add the 17th Amendment, and, that's the one, and that would pr likely happen here, too. Although, you know, it would be with it would be to address these three issues of fiscal restraint, reigning in federal power, and term limits for federal offices. But then again, they may very well take those positions and fix them. If we get 33 and we're about to go to 34, That's what I'm saying. they may, may, may go ahead and take and do what they should have done without us having to go through this that's, process. That's the historical precedent. That's what they did with the 17th Amendment. That's and also, there were those who have said that, well, it really, it's in the Constitution, but they really didn't mean it. But I think clearly, if you'll read Article 5, it clearly says that provided that no amendment, which may be made prior to the year of 1808, shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. My reason for pointing that out is in the, in the body of Article 5, it clearly says that we expect you people, you states, in this balancing of power to use this from time to time in our federal government, even in this document. In other words, even in the Constitution itself, if they determined that some parts of it didn't work, 
or it wasn't working in the best interest of the country, then they recognized that it was necessary that we come in and make possible changes or amendments, even at that point, if Congress didn't. Yeah, um, Hamilton in Federalist 85, the words of this article, talking about Article 5, are preemptory. Nothing in particular is left to the discretion of that body, meaning Congress. We may safely rely on the disposition of the state legislatures to erect barriers against the encroachments of the national authority. And that was their view of why they put Article 5. And I, I'll tell you another interesting notion. You know, we've had, we've had the debate about nullification in this chamber right. before you were here. But those who've been here a while, you all can remember the nullification of debates that we've had. And um, Madison actually weighed in on that during the nullification crisis of 1832. And, and Madison cited Article 5 as the means to push back against the federal government, not nullification. That's interesting. He, he cited Article 5 as something that, that is a legitimate constitutional way to push back against federal authority, not nullification of a federal law. Now, we know... We also learned in that debate about the Prince decision and, and, and you can't commandeer state officials to do the bidding of the federal government. That's another limit on federal power. But Madison said, no, John C. Calhoun may come out and hit me with lightning. <laughs> no, nullification is not the way right. to do it. It's an Article 5 convention is what Madison said. That We put that in there when it's this bad where you feel like you need to nullify something. Um, and finally, as it relates to the, the, the protections of our delegates and not allowing our delegates to go out, you, you're comfortable with the, the language that we're trying to work to make sure there's limitation on our delegates. They won't become federal agents. They are state agents. It's a they convention state of, of states, not they are, of the federal They are government. state agents. They are South Carolina's agents and we control our South Carolina agents. And if they violate the rules, regulations, then we can immediately recall them and they have no power to void ab initio their authority. That's so, correct. And we have a bill that would accompany this that would establish an oath that they, may, they must give if they're going to be a delegate and then a, a criminal penalties if they violate that oath. You think that, and based upon all of your reading, is a are you comfortable that that will protect the state of South Carolina at that convention? Well, I am comfortable. I wasn't comfortable initially, but like you, I've, I've studied myself to be comfortable. Thank you. I'm here live in Philadelphia at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. When you hear the phrase, lives, fortunes, and sacred honor, these are the folks we should think of. Those who anonymously gave their lives. Well, today you have a chance to volunteer. You need to volunteer for conventionofstates.com, the movement that's going to save the country. These folks are willing to step up and give everything. We need you to give just a little bit. Go to conventionofstates.com and volunteer today.